If you don't have your foundation in place, it could be Gary Vanderchuk. It doesn't matter. It could be Mark Zuckerberg himself running the ads. It doesn't matter. It doesn't because matter. Because the strategy is not locked in. Wherever you feel fear, that's where you You've got to become the person that will attract over 200 different cognitive biases. The real work in any business is thinking. Welcome to the FLW podcast. We are so excited to have another amazing leader on the show today. Um, my name is Cody DeGraff and I'm here with my co-host Gabriel Klingman. Hey, what's up everybody? Just a quick reminder, if you could subscribe to this, that would be amazing. We're here to provide value for you. And if you get any value at all out of this, just hit that like button. Awesome, guys. So, guys, today we have Alex Karajanidis on the sh in the house tonight. Now, for those of you who don't know Alex, he's the founder of BSM Volt, which is a digital result marketing agency. Now, Alex uses this full-scale marketing agency to help other realtors and mortgage brokers live out their dreams. Um, he has got so much credibility being in the industry for over 15 plus years, and uh, he's helped people actually 10 to 20x their business. So, if you guys are realtors, mortgage brokers, a part of the real estate industry, or even simply just trying to look how to better market yourself. This is the podcast to be listening to. So Alex, how's it going, brother? Thanks for being on the show. Oh uh, man, very glad to be here. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks for the cool intro. You actually said my last name perfectly. Excellent. Uh, He's been you must have watched some of my videos or something because normally people don't say the last name like that. Um, but uh, very glad to be here. Excited to be here. Appreciate you guys. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, we like to kind of start off the show with a, just like a fun little icebreaker, if that's all right with you. Sure. Um, and we're going to try something a little different. So I, I'm calling this thing the the five rapid. And what we're going to do is ask you five questions. Uh, which one would you rather kind of questions? And, uh, and then we'll just kind of see how it goes from there. All right. Sure. So, let's do it. First question. So would you rather have $1,000 in gold or $1,000 in silver? I would rather have $1,000 in gold for sure. I'm a, I'm a gold guy. My wife makes fun of me because uh, I'm, I'm old school, uh, Greek background. My parents are immigrants. I was born in Greece. My first language was Greek. I didn't learn English until I was like, you know, later on in life. But uh, I remember all my aunts, uncles, dad, my dad, my mom, everybody, all, all they wore was gold, gold uh, crosses, gold bracelets. When I, when I brought out the gold to my wife before we got married, we were dating. She goes, what are you wearing? I'm like, what do you mean? What are you wearing? <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, gold all day. Awesome. 100%. percent um, Italian food or South American food? Uh, Italian. I'm Greek, oh. man. I love Italian food. I love I'm Greek. Italian. I love I feel pizzas. That. I love it. Mm -hmm. I love all kinds of Italian food. So Italian all day. Excellent. All right. What about yard sale or selling it all on Facebook marketplace? Yard sale. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Yard sale. We love yeah. yard sales. Okay. <laughs> My wife, Especially where we live here, it's crazy. People just park outside and they just, you know, you know, somebody's garbage is uh, somebody else's treasure, you know? So mm -hmm. we love going into these cool yard sales. And we did a couple of yard sales when we left San Diego before we left here. We sold almost 90% of, of everything we had uh, via our yard sales. So uh, not yard sales. <laughs> 100%. Um, forever Chicago or forever Colorado? Chicago. Ooh, yeah. I'm a diehard Chicago everything uh, besides the White Sox. So I'm a diehard Cubs fan, Bears, Blackhawks, Bulls. Well, you basically just answered the last question, which is Boston Red Sox or Chicago Cubs. I oh, think yeah. we know the answer to that. We're yeah. from New England, so we figured we'd throw in a controversial question. So yeah, for us, <laughs> hey, that's listen, a controversial question right there. I, I'm a fan of the Red Sox. I love the Red Sox. I, I, I love uh, the Patriots. I, I have no idea why Tom Brady decided to do what he did and Oh, and man, his career yeah. somewhere else. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Weird to me. I'm a huge fan of Tom Brady, Belichick. Uh, he should have. He should have retired. That that's the problem. Did he play for New England for 20 years? He. I don't know how long it was, but all I know is is that he was at his peak with that last winning of the Super Bowl. And if he had just retired, then I think that would have been the best for him. I don't know what he was thinking. I think he played for for New England for 20 years. That's I think insane. he had a 20 yeah. year run. So why would you not want to end your career? and just call it a wrap it's not money because mm. his wife makes more money yeah. than he does it's yeah. it's like i don't understand I, so I, so who knows what, what what's really all into that decision that he made but um yeah i'm a diehard cubs fan but i love boston i really do <laughs> fair <laughs> enough well thank you so much my dude um so let's just dive in right here uh we're gonna get a little personal if you're fine with that um sure. how how did you get started what's kind of your story and how you became the person you are today and how you got to where you are yeah awesome question um long story so i'll shorten it up because there's uh you know there's a lot to it but uh, uh, like i said i was originally born and raised in chicago 
uh, come from an awesome Greek family, Greek background. My, my parents are immigrants. My dad played professional soccer in Greece. Wow. Um, he, he brought the first Greek national team to Chicago. So he was, he was, he was the real deal back then. Uh, but back then, even today, uh, soccer isn't anywhere near as popular as it is around the world. Mm. Um, so he knew he couldn't make a living playing soccer. And then my mom was an immigrant too. Her brothers played soccer, my uncles, and they all met at a game in Chicago. My mom was living in Manhattan, New York at the time. My dad was living in Chicago. Mm. And they met in Chicago because my mom went to see her brothers play and then met my father and, and the rest is history. So I was raised... Um, they didn't know any English. <laughs> so when I was born, uh, we moved to Greece when I was about, you know, I lived in Greece from 18 months to about four years old. Wow. And that's I, cool. and I, you know, then I learned English, went to, went to Greek school first, then English school. Uh, but I learned a lot from my parents, seeing them uh, work really hard and, you know, being immigrants, they didn't work for anybody but themselves. They were entrepreneurs. Mm. Um, my dad, uh, had fruit markets, uh, coffee shops, dry cleaners, restaurants, nightclubs, uh, my mom was in the beauty salon business. So growing up, they always provided a roof over us. They loved us. They weren't good at managing money, but they were good at making money, you know? Yeah, uh, they knew absolutely. how to make it. They didn't know how to manage it. So they just spent a whole lot of it. And unfortunately, those, uh, those habits got trickled down to myself and my sister. Mm -hmm. uh, but growing up, great, 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 you know, great memories growing up as a child. And then 2002, so fast forward, 2002, I left Chicago and moved to San Diego. Yeah. And uh, in San Diego is how I got involved in the mortgage business. I started off as a telemarketer. Um, I just needed wow. to get a job. I didn't yeah. have, yeah, it was horrible. I didn't have, <laughs> I didn't have a, a college degree. I dropped out of college. Um, you know, I, I got involved in sports. I got involved in a lot of uh, activities, helping my family out with their businesses. So yeah. money wasn't really an issue when I was growing up in Chicago. Not that I had a lot of money. It's just, we always were provided for and, I just always like to have fun. And that's just all my friends. We did the same thing. So when I went to San Diego, uh, I didn't have anything. I didn't have any money in my bank account. I didn't have a college degree. Um, I was like, okay, this is the real world. Let's roll. And then I got a job as a telemarketer. And, and looking back today, uh, it, was, it was probably the best training I ever got starting off. In, uh, in the career that I ended up having. So many people in. say that. That's so interesting. Oh, yeah. We, yeah. we, at that time, there was no laws and regulations like there are today. At that time, mm. you call, it was like the wild, wild west. You call anybody you want, <laughs> anytime you want. So we yeah. were calling from California. We were calling the East Coast, Florida first, then moving west. Mm. And we were making six days a week. We were making 500 calls a day. What? Oh, yeah. I was wearing headsets like you guys are wearing and yeah. we had a predictive dialer and it would dial for us and whoever answered, we, we would, we would talk and whoever didn't answer, we would go to the next call. Wow. And 95% of the calls were F you get a life, oh, get a job, hang up. Yeah. But 5% of the calls were not F you get a life, hang up. They were like, <laughs> yeah. Hey, well, tell me more. And we were, and at that time I was working for a refi loan uh, mortgage company, kind of like mm -hmm. a, a refi chop shop company. Um, yeah. cause at that time there was a big refi market, mm -hmm. uh, similar to what's going on right now. Yeah. Um, so that's how I started in the business. I uh, became a telemarketer, uh, got thick skin right away. I already had thick skin cause I was raised in Chicago. So I wasn't really concerned about oh, yeah. uh, people you know, saying no to me. They were really saying no to me. They were saying no to my offer, you know? Mm. I love that. Um, and that's love how that. I started the mortgage business. And then about eight months later, I evolved and got promoted to becoming a junior LO. And uh, that was a horrible experience. The company didn't do any training. Basically, uh, the telemarketing division, which I worked for, now as a junior LO, I would basically just call the leads that the telemarketers would give us. Wow. So I realized really fast, most telemarketers were lying on their apps, <laughs> you know, huh, just to, yeah. just to pump up their numbers. Cause most yeah. of the people I was calling were like, I don't know what you're talking about. Click, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I got fired for that job really fast. I think within three months I got fired cause you had to hit a quota mm -hmm. and I didn't hit the quota. So they fired me. That's and, crazy. Uh, yeah, it was great. And I remember this is, this is, I remember this like it was yesterday. So my wife now, who I've been with for 18 years, uh, was working at the same company. That's how we met. She moved from Portland. I moved from Chicago. We met at the same telemarketing company. Wow. And then she became a processor for the mortgage company. And I became an LO. And uh, her and I were friends. And we had a lot of friends that we all hung out together. And we all did lunch together. So she called me during the day, the day that I got fired. She and I got fired. And she goes, hey, where are you at? Where are we going to meet for lunch? And I'm like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass out lunch today. 
She goes, what do you mean? You're not going to eat? I'm like, well, I just got fired. She goes, you got fired? <laughs> I, I go, yeah. She goes, ah, don't worry about it. It's all good. Why don't you take a cruise and go to the beach? Go to Mission Beach. Mission Beach is uh, one of the beaches we would go to. And yeah, she goes, just go relax. Don't worry about it. It'll take care of itself. I'm like, all right, that sounds like a good idea. I got nothing else to do. I'll do that. Uh, and then we'll hook up later. And then she calls me like not even an hour later. And she goes, hey, where are you? I'm like, I'm in Mission Beach. You told me to go to Mission Beach and hang out. I'm just chilling by myself. What's up? And she goes, hey, I need you to meet somebody um, like now. He's waiting for you. I'm like, who do you want me to meet? She goes, trust me. Just go here and here. And I want you to meet somebody. He's waiting for you. Yeah. So long story short, I ended up meeting this gentleman, which was about a half hour away from where I was at. We ended up having a lunch for like four hours. And this guy ended up being my mentor and took me under his wing. And the next day hired me and I had a four or five year run with him that literally was, uh, was a huge, like just momentum boost for me in my career and my life. And that's how I really got serious about the mortgage business. Uh, and I, and I had a good four year, five year run with him, uh, until the meltdown hit, we had a mortgage meltdown, yeah. uh, that hit the whole country, especially in California oh. about 2008, 2009. Yeah. Oh, we remember that. Yeah. yeah, you guys remember that. So we all got crushed. Um, you know, we at that time, my my wife now and I were partners, we we decided to form a, a brokerage, which we did under my mentor's guidance. Yeah, and we we're doing well, we we're doing very well, actually. But, but we didn't know that it wasn't going to last. Mm -hmm. So we were acting like this is gonna be forever. And then you know, the mortgage meltdown hit and we basically were in the red every month for like 11 months straight. And then month yeah. ago, we had nothing and we couldn't even pay our rent. And, and uh, I had to reinvent myself and, and I did, we fought through it. We powered through it. My, my wife said, what are we going to do? I said, we'll figure it out. And I found a coach, another coach, uh, a company called the core. I don't know if you ever heard of this company. They're Sounds a big, uh, yeah, they're a big mortgage and real estate company. Okay. And uh, I ended up finding them or they found me um, through just, you know, the, the universe, right? I just put it out there. I just said, Hey man, I got to step it up. I got to evolve. I got to grow. I got to reinvent myself. And all of a sudden out of nowhere, this guy comes and <laughs> Okay, nice. let's check this guy out. And that was uh, another pivot. So yeah, yeah, I can go on and on. Story's long. <laughs> no, that's amazing, dude. And obviously, you know, you've been incredibly successful. I watch a lot of your videos. Yeah. Excellent videos. Great oh, advice. And, thank you. Um, and so I, I kind of want to hop into kind of just getting some wisdom from you, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, let's just say that I, I just got my license as a realtor or a mortgage broker. Or I'm just in the industry now. What are some of the first steps that you would recommend that I take immediately? Well, this is for anybody, not just you being brand new or, or your scenario of you being a brand new agent. Uh, sure, I just yeah. think this is universal one-on-one -on -one for everybody is you, you got to, I think where a lot of people get it wrong um, is they don't understand their, their, their avatar, right? Or their perfect client or their perfect audience of who they want to serve. Um, just my agency, for example, we get a lot of people that come to us and, and they want leads or they think they want leads or they want us yeah. to run ads or they think they want us to run ads and they come to us and I say, well, let's, let's, let's open up the vault here and see what you got going on. Cause you might not have a lead problem. You might have some other issues that we got to fill up yeah, and totally. almost 99 times out of a hundred, uh, the issue is that they don't have their, their audience identified. So your question the answer for somebody that's brand new is I would say, okay, who do you want to serve the most? Mm. You know, who, who do you want to serve the most? Is it, is it a first time buyer? Uh, is it a first time seller? Is it an investor? Is it somebody that's in the luxury market? It's always uh, good to start off with a target audience first. Okay. Yeah. Because what happens after that, let's say you want to work with first time buyers. Yeah. Um, then the next step is your message right? Mm -hmm. Your message has to be aligned or in line with your target audience. And the message for a first time buyer is going to be very different than a message for an investor or a message for a flipper mm -hmm. or, a or a message for a doctor that's bought like five homes in his last 20 years, right? It's different messages. It's going to get their attention, right? So being brand new in real estate or brand new in lending uh, is great, right? It's a great adventure. You're about to start. Um, I believe you got to have your, your market dialed in of who you want to serve. Then behind, right after that, you, you pick up your message, you, you dial in your message. And then right behind that, you want to make sure that you're involved in all the platforms that are available right now. Social yeah. media today has made it so easy to get your message in front of anybody you want, whenever you want. Mm. And I'm not talking about spamming, uh, but that's what I would do. I would start off with your target audience. I call it a perfect avatar. Uh, then, then create a message that's geared for that target audience. 
Yeah. And then start getting all your platforms dialed in so you can be relevant in all those platforms. And the message is consistent across all those platforms. I've tried to do that. That's, that's yeah. amazing. No, that's yeah. so good. And it makes sense too, because I feel like when people just get started in the industry, they, they think like, I'm going to serve everybody. I'm huge. It's going to be big. You know, like I want to get into all of it. So that makes so much sense. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. There's a saying, I'm sure you guys have heard it before that there's riches in the niches. Um, yeah. I, I didn't create the saying it's been around forever, but a perfect example for me in 2012, I'm 10 years in the mortgage business at this time. In 2012, I get an opportunity to be a branch manager for a company called Veterans United Home Loans. Great company okay. yeah. out of Columbia, Missouri. They only serve veterans and active military families. So when I jumped on board, my mentor at the time, the area manager said, hey, there's riches in the niches. You're only going to serve veteran and active military families. Yeah. And you're only going to do VA loans. And I'm like, what? I've done loans for 10 years. I think I've done like three VA loans my whole 10 year run. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I go, Maybe yeah. you guys got the wrong guy, but, but she, she made a point and, and my, my best two year run in my 16 year career in the mortgage business was with VU because yeah. I always served one audience. There's a, there's a power of a method called the power of ones. Keep it very simple. One audience, yeah. one message, one landing page, one funnel, one offer. Uh, and it worked like gold then. And it works like gold today. So, uh, simplicity is is powerful having yeah. clarity is powerful there's a book called the one page marketing plan alan deeb is the author great guy great author he's a serial entrepreneur out of australia and he talks about this in his book the simplicity of having a one page marketing and sales plan the clarity of understanding you're serving one audience with one message is powerful yeah wow. and that that could work for anybody real estate lending my world your world it's universal so, All of it, yeah so i believe that's in it that's so interesting because that's a very different perspective than what like a lot of people would think and teach which actually makes me want to ask you this question what, do you have like a unique philosophy when it comes to social media well when you say unique philosophy uh, hmm. i definitely have a methodology and a philosophy that i i live and work off of um I believe in being congruent in all platforms. I believe your channel arts on mm -hmm. LinkedIn and YouTube and your Facebook business page uh, have to be very similar, if not identical, right? They're different yeah, sizes, yeah. obviously, to all these platforms. I yeah. believe your bio and your message has to be congruent. Uh, and I believe you have to be omnipresent. It's funny, the question you just asked, Gabriel, is interesting. I was on a chat today in LinkedIn and people were, were debating, should I be in one platform or should I be in many platforms? It was a cool question. It was a cool debate. There's, there's really no wrong answer. But my opinion is in order to become omnipresent, which is very important in marketing, the word omnipresent is very important, right? It's basically be everywhere. Um, I think it's very relevant to be on each platform because you have different audiences on different platforms. Yes, yeah, some could sprinkle on all of them. But, you know, uh, 80%, 90% that are LinkedIn, they're all LinkedIn. 80%, 90% that are on yeah. IG, Instagram, they're all IG, Instagram. Yeah. Same with Facebook, same with YouTube, right? Um, but I believe that it's important to understand one piece of content can be redistributed on all the platforms. Mm. Right. So the problem right. a lot of people have is they don't understand how powerful content is um, and how powerful it is to become omnipresent. And what holds most people back, in my opinion, is they think they need to deliver all this new content all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I tell them that's not accurate. Uh, I, I put out uh, eight blog articles a month, uh, but I use those eight blog articles for my videos, for my mm -hmm. webinars, for my emails, for my blog posts, for my ads. Like I redistribute the, the content. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my content is is obviously geared for my audience, but, and I'm not a, I'm not a copywriter by any means. I'm not good at copyright. So, I have people on my team that ghostwrite for me and then I fill in the blanks and I make it more my style, but that's awesome. Yeah. I think you got to be in all platforms, Gabriel. I think to be omnipresent and, and, and it depends what industry you're in, but if you're a realtor, mm -hmm. a real estate professional, I don't care if you're brand new, you've been doing this for 30 years. If you're a mortgage mm -hmm. professional, I don't care if you're brand new, you've been doing this for 30 years. You got to understand the power today that we have with these platforms. It's never been like this. Our message mm -hmm. matters, right? Yeah. More than ever. People mm -hmm. want, to be led. You see what's going on with politics. You see what's going on in the world with these protests and riots. People are confused left and right, mm. right? People are confused left and right. I don't care what side you're on. We're all in this together. Uh, but people want to be led right now. People want to be educated, informed, entertained. And I believe there's power in being on all the platforms because mm. you never know who you're going to touch. This month I brought in, I don't know how many clients we brought in. We don't bring in 
a lot of clients every month because we never want to bottleneck. A good month for us is like six to eight new clients. Wow. That's good that's, for us. That's amazing. That's great. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's good. We built it. I wanted more because I was used to the mortgage business where we're closing 15, 20, 30, 40 loans a month. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, big producers, that's what they close. And I'm like, well, isn't that what you're supposed to do in the agency? And I realized really fast, no, because yeah. you'll bottleneck <laughs> the system, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, but this month, I tell you right now with 100% certainty, uh, the business that comes to me that came from social media and my ads, mm -hmm. which is about five clients out of the, the seven or eight that we picked up, all came one from LinkedIn, one from YouTube, one from Google, one from Facebook, one from Instagram. Wow. No joke. Yeah. Wow. wow. Right. They, they, and this was cold that they got warmed up yeah. Yeah. and then they came into our world. I'm not saying wow. they, they, they came in yesterday and I signed them up today. It takes time, but all came from each platform that I'm in. So I believe that you have to be in all platforms, if that makes wow, sense. Wow, that's amazing. Now, you've kind of trademarked your own personal recipe for success. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, that being uh, content plus reach plus engagement equals opportunity. Now, can you get kind of expand on that a little bit and what that means? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge believer in that. I've been saying that for a long time. Um, when I opened up my agency a little over three years ago, uh, I was saying that. Um, the, more, the more content you put out there, Content that's relevant. Let me be crystal clear. Here. Content sure. that's relevant to your audience, right? Yeah. You can't just put out content just to say I put out content. It has to be relevant to your audience. It has to hit a chord. That's why it's so important to dial in your target audience. Like for me, my lane is real estate sector because mm -hmm. that's the space I was in for 16 years. Even though I was in the mortgage business, I dealt with realtors almost 80% of my career. So when I decided to open up the agency, uh, my first coach, Billy Jean, is marketing, who's out of San Diego. Um, said, Hey man, just pick a lane and, and then dominate that lane. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, since you've been doing loans and real estate for so long, it's probably an easy transition for you. Cause you know what you're doing. I can't tell you how many clients we picked up in the last three years that said, Hey, we interviewed multiple other agencies and we picked you because you know, our industry, yeah, we picked up a yeah. client this morning from Northern California. <laughs> he interviewed seven agencies, gave wow. us the green light today. I knew he was going to give us the green light. I felt it. And I said, Hey, why'd you pick us? And he said, besides the, the synergy, the dynamic that we have, he and I had, yeah, he was yeah. really, it's because you know my, my industry. These mm -hmm. other guys had no clue about my industry, but they're, they're digital marketers. Wow. Uh, wow. So uh, getting back to content reach and engagement, um, the reason why I'm so big on content reach and engagement is because all social media platforms have different kinds of algorithms. Uh, Facebook has algorithms. Yeah. Um, Instagram, obviously Facebook owns Instagram, Google has algorithms, LinkedIn has algorithms, YouTube has algorithms. The algorithms can be manipulated in your favor. And in order to do that, you want the platform, let's just say Facebook, for example, the business side, you want them to have a lot of impressions because impressions for them is data. And yeah. Facebook and Google is all about data. And I learned this trick when I was learning digital marketing about 2013, 2014 was post more, not less. Right. So we were posting six times a day on our, on our clients' business pages back when I first launched my agency, yeah, which yeah. is 42 times a week. Wow. Yeah. Which is a lot. But what we wow. noticed is as, as the reach increased, once you get a page to 10,000 people reach per week or more, yep. and the majority of that reach is all organic posts mixed in with ads, right? Yep. And then once that page can parlay the reach to engagement, which typically you want about a 10% engagement to the reach. So in this case, a thousand people engage per week. Facebook's yeah. happy because they have the impressions. That's the reach. We're happy if you know what to do with the engagement with retargeting, because now I got a thousand people times four in a month. That's 4,000 in a yeah. year. That's 48,000 people I could retarget mm, nice. and build better body audiences. So the whole concept around content reach and engagement was the more content you put out that's relevant to your audience, the more reach you're going to get, the more engagement you're going to get equals opportunities. And that couldn't be, I mean, it's more relevant now than it's ever been. It's proven, mm -hmm. right? So wow. that's, how, that's where I got that. Beautiful. <laughs> Freaking so beautiful. So good. Love yeah. that. Uh, so you talk about, um, obviously, you know what you're talking about. And you've mentioned before um, about inbound marketing and outbound marketing. Can you explain a little bit about those, some of the distinctions between them? Yeah, it's a great question too. Um, I, I believe you need a balance of both uh, because outbound marketing is is basically whether you're running ads, um, you know, you're doing organic posts. That's outbound marketing, right? Your your yep. outflow is going to dictate your inflow. Uh, there's a great marketer out there, Jeremy Haynes. I followed him for a little bit. Young, 
um, you know, everybody's younger than I am. The, the, the digital space, they're all, they're all youngsters. You're all, they're they're all, all like, literally, literally. <laughs> yeah. One of my coaches is 24. I'm like, oh my God, I'm like double your age and you're teaching me, but they know what they're talking about. They're That's introverts. The they got into this space years ago and they weren't playing sports. They weren't playing video games. They weren't messing out outside. They were stuck inside and they were spending 12, 15 hour days learning stuff that takes adults years to learn. They were learning them in like weeks. So yeah. he made a comment to me once, outflow because inflow. The more outflow you have, the more opportunities you have to come back, which is very accurate. Yeah, so totally. outbound marketing is you're running ads. You're, you're doing stuff that goes out. Inbound marketing, which I believe is more effective when they come to you, mm. is you, you're doing a buyer guide or a seller guide if you're a realtor. You're doing a webinar masterclass you're teaching people how to buy a house if they're first time buyers or how to use their VA home loan entitlement if you're working with veterans uh, or if you're on the lending side. You're putting out good content to get people to come into your world. Um, half of my leads every month come from inbound marketing and the other half come from outbound marketing. So you want a combination of both. Wow. I like to combine organic with paid. Mm. Organic is free, obviously, and paid is your advertising, you're spending money. I like a combination of both. I don't even tell people to advertise and spend money mm. until they have their foundation in place. Even when they hire us Interesting. To, to take over, right? Because we're an agency that we have a done for you model where we just do everything for them. I still have to be very selective today more than ever because the last thing I want is to bring on a client and two months later, because we don't have contracts, two months later to say, hey, it's not working out. That's yeah. my fault, not their fault because mm. I didn't do my due diligence to make sure they were a right fit. And a right fit is you have your foundation in place. Yeah, absolutely. If, if you don't have your foundation in place, it could be Gary Vanderchuk. It doesn't matter. It could be Mark Zuckerberg himself running the ads. It doesn't matter it doesn't because matter, the yeah. strategy is not locked in. The fulfillment's not locked in. The follow-up's not locked in. Everything that you need to, to, to deliver and get an ROI is not in place. The mm -hmm. assembly line is broken, right? The yeah. problem that people have is they focus more on ads and leads and, and funnels and landing pages. But I think those are all very important. Yeah. But I believe that's 20% of the equation. Wow. 80%, which is all of it mostly, is all the strategy, the yeah. system. That's what people lack. Most people lack. Strategy is more important than the technical, tactical part. Um, what's his name? Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Great book, Love right? That. Uh, most that. My favorite about it. book, book by far. Yeah, it's a great book. Uh, he says it all the time. He goes, yeah. uh, attitude, right, it, and your drive is 80% of the battle. Mm, the technical yeah. part's only 20%. If you, have, if you have the right headspace and you don't give up, right, and you do good, you're going to succeed if you don't give up, right? The 20%, which is technical, that's easy. Like 20, my, in my agency, we run a lot of ads. I have 22 and 23-year-olds that run all our ads. Yeah. Right. Wow. That's not yeah. where the, that's yeah. not where the money's made. The money's made in the strategy. The exactly. money's made in setting everything up. No, this is great. And uh, you know, I think this is a perfect segue into some, um, I, I'd love it if you could just answer some personal development questions, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, so the first one I would want to ask you is how important is it who you surround yourself with? I mean, it's extremely, extremely important. And they say, tell me who your five friends are. Tell me the average of their bank accounts. And you're probably going to be very close to that average, right? So yeah, if wow. you hang yeah. out with people, yeah, if you hang out with people that aren't as driven as you are, they're, they're smoking weed, they're playing video games, they're, you know, they're making forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year, nothing wrong with that. Um, you, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to be around <laughs> that. That's kind of how you're, you're going to, yeah. that's just what's going to end up happening, you know? So you have to separate yourself and you have to surround yourself with good people that have good integrity, that are similar as far as quality and values to you. But the older I've gotten, uh, the more selective I am with my time and who comes in my inner circle. When you're younger, you're sick, you're, you don't even have a circle. You're like, oh, you like me? Cool, you're in. <laughs> you know? Right, exactly. Like, you, you, wanna be, you, wanna, you wanna be liked, you wanna be, you know, and it depends right. on your personality. I was, mm. I was, uh, I was a, a natural leader, but it was hidden in me. I was a late bloomer, mm. so I, I, I like to be around cool people because you know that's what I thought you needed to do you know I didn't realize till after like my 20s and my early 30s that you know I'm pretty cool just by myself you know and I and I and I realized like I don't have to have a lot of people like me uh I do want some people to like me a lot and those are the people that are very important to me but the reality is like 
we're on this journey on this on this world um, by ourselves, living the lives that we're living, chapters right. that we're going through, you know, and we're and we're and we're like sharing the world with each other. So yeah, mm-hmm. we have to be good human beings to each other, but you need to have a lot of friends. You have to surround yourself with good people. For me now in my life, I want people that are, especially agency owners, I want agency owners that are making eight figures, nine figures. I want yeah, those agency yeah, yeah. owners that I look up to because, you know, where I'm at, if I continue doing what I'm doing, I'm going to continue getting the same results. And there's nothing wrong right. with where I'm at, but I want, a, I want an eight-figure agency. I want a nine-figure agency. How am I going to get that? By hanging out with people that do less with me? No. I got to hang out with people that do more with me. That's uh, I want to be physically good fit. Yeah. I, want to, I want to be a great husband to my wife. Uh, I love my wife dearly. She's taught me a lot. She's my best teacher. I have these amazing ch- children that I want, to, I want them to see me as a role model, and I am. Uh, I want to guide and protect them. That only comes by me always growing and evolving. So who you surround yourself is huge. Yeah, brilliant. On this whole personal development vein, uh, what are three books that have impacted you personally the most? Well, I mean, I got so many books that have impacted me. Um, I mean... <laughs> You know, the, the, the basic one, I mean, not the basic ones. I can't assume everybody reads the same books I read, but um, the, the Thick and Grow Rich book was, was a big callus for me years yeah. ago. So mm-hmm. I was a big book reader, but I read the wrong books, mm-hmm. right? When I was growing up in Chicago, the only books I read, and this is funny, because uh, I always wanted to be like a mobster, yeah, it was <laughs> true crime books, right? Chicago I read mobster, mobster books. 100%. The mob, I mean, I was... I was obsessed with Al Capone, yeah, John yeah, Gotti, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the Chicago mob, the New York mob, the Boston mob. I was obsessed. My, my, favorite, book, my favorite movie growing up was Goodfellas and Godfather 2. Oh, Godfather bro. 1 and 2. Yes. Yeah, those are my favorite it. movies. My wife said, what was your favorite movie? And I said, uh, Goodfellas, Godfather. She never even heard of these movies. I'm like, what was your favorite one? She's like, Sound of Music. Have you ever saw it? She goes, yeah, uh, yeah. Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> yeah. like, huh? Dude, I don't even know what those movies are. Very are. What are you talking about? We're very similar. My wife and, and your wife and you and I, that's hilarious, dude. Because yeah. I was born and raised in Indiana. So you were my neighbor, just so you know. Yeah, I mean, I so I grew up reading true crime books. There was a section in, yeah. I, I lived before I became like an adult and the nightlife came into my world. I was like a, a, a nerdy basketball player that uh, that lived in Barnes & Noble. Right. There was a Barnes and Noble near my house. I literally spent Friday nights and Saturday nights there, literally sitting on the floor, reading yes. true crime books for yes. hours. <laughs> yes. yeah. That right. was my awesome. childhood. I get that. I get That's that. Yeah. Awesome. So awesome. Uh, uh, I met this guy. I don't know if you guys ever heard of this. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of like selling speakers from the side of a van. Have you guys mm. ever had that in your area? I don't think so. Have we? I don't. I, don't I think we it, have. It, I'm pretty sure we have. It was yeah. pretty big in Chicago, uh, yeah. and I got this job once, this summer mm-hmm. job, where I literally sold speakers from the side of the van. It was an awesome experience. I won't. I won't go into detail. It's a. It's another podcast. But one of my guys, who was my mentor, said, "Hey, what kind of books do you read?" And this is going to answer your question of my top three. And I told him what kind of books I read, and he's like, "Bro, he goes, come on, dude, are you going to be a mobster?" He goes, "Really? Is that what you want in life?" I go, "Yeah, kind of. That's what I want. Is that bad?" I go, "I don't want to hurt anybody, but I, I kind of well, like yeah, the I do stuff, the pinky <laughs> rings and all that." Um, so he's like, "No, bro." He goes, "You got to learn how to understand your mind, personal development, and sales." So he takes yeah. me to Barnes and Noble, which I already knew. He goes, "This is my Barnes and Noble. Where do you need to go?" I know this back on the head. He goes, "Take me to the personal development and sales section." I'm like, uh, "I don't know where it is." So he takes me there and he gives me my first book. Mm. It was "The Greatest Salesman in the World" by Og Mandino. Interesting. And that was my first book that I read on sales and personal development. And as obsessed as I was with the mob and that world, I knew that wasn't <laughs> going to be my life because I just yeah. can't hurt anybody or don't want to. Um, I immediately got obsessed. And I started diving in and I, I had a new section in Barnes & Noble that was way bigger, which yeah. was the personal development and sales section. So that was my first one, The, the Greatest Salesman in the World by Ogmandino. Right behind that was Think and Grow Rich uh, by Napoleon Hill. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then Dale That's Carnegie's How to Win Friends mm. and Influence People. Those are my three wow. pillars that I started my journey. Uh, and those are classics. I read those Such still classics. Today. Such yeah. classics. Yeah, they're yeah. good books. Good seeds to be planted, not the mm. other ones, you know? Exactly. Think and Grow Rich changed my mind set yeah. so much. It was revolutionary. Yeah, it's, a, well, it's an amazing book. And the principles of that book are as relevant today as they ever were. 
Um, mm. Acres of Diamond, for example. I don't know if you guys oh, ever read that. Oh, Earl Nightingale, bro. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I love listening to that guy. My audibles are all Earl Nightingale because that guy's yeah. voice is just, I'm like, oh, man, whatever what you're saying, I love amazing it. Amazing you know? story. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that 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 was that was I don't know if you guys know the story of that. That was delivered almost five thousand times from nineteen hundred to nineteen twenty five. I right? just different learned presentations, about this a couple right? Ago. I was blown away. It's crazy. Uh, yeah, it's a hundred years ago. Yeah. More, it's and it's, nice. it's it's I did not know that. It's yeah, nice. and it's as relevant today that it's ever been. Right, literally. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I just actually, um, I just, yeah, I just read it last month um, again, and I was blown away. I'm like, how is this still so relevant? <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Um, it's funny. The older I get, the more I evolve and I get out of my comfort zone. Uh, my wife's really big with Dr. Wayne Dyer. Yep, yep. And I knew about Dr. Wayne Dyer, uh, but I never really got into his teachings. Uh, I just never got into it. It was never against him. It just never was something that I had so many other things I was interested in. And then uh, I started noticing my, my wife listening to a lot of podcasts and, and uh, I was curious and she's like, I, I need you to listen to this podcast. And uh, now I started diving into his world, getting more spiritual. Um, you know, as you get older, you start realizing, you know, there's a lot that is still yet to be uncovered, which is really oh, yeah. exciting and cool. Mm -hmm. And now I'm in this new kind of like, I don't know, just trajectory in life where I'm all about like meditation and yeah, you and, and Gabe would get along yoga. so well. <laughs> well I, I feel this. I feel this. I have some recommendations for you after this. We are golden, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 I'm in it, man. Here's a, here's a, I don't mean for this to be a morbid question at all. I just, um, I think it's a really interesting question hearing it from every single person we ask. And mm -hmm. that is, let's just say that you're in your last moments. Okay. Yeah. And you got some people around you now. What are, what is the final piece of advice that you would give those around you in your last moments? Ooh, that's a good question. We've gotten it's a, a different it's a answer. It's a, every it's, time. A, it's a scary question though. Mm. Right. Like uh, a lot, yeah. my wife has a really good perspective on, mm. on life and dying. And she's like, so many people look at dying like a, such a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And my wife has a very different perspective. My wife's like, we were on this planet for such a short period of time, babe. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's her spiritual side stepping in. She's a, she's a hippie from Portland, right? So her mom nice. was a hippie, uh, which I love. Don't get it wrong. That's I'm not, great. Uh, I'm, yeah, it's, it's super cool. But she says, you know, this is an adventure we're on, right? And there's good times, bad times, different chapters in our book of life. And when we go, and we're all going to go, right? Mm -hmm. Where we go from here, we don't know, right? Uh, who, everybody has different opinions. But her perspective of life is dying, it, it could be a celebration, right? We, we lose the people that when they go away physically and we get hurt. You know, I've lost so many people in my life from all kinds of different situations. And it's so yeah. hard, you know, it's kind of like makes your heart so cold because you're like, oh my mm. God, this is horrible, right? Yeah. But as long as, we're, uh, as long as we're on this planet and we do the best we could do, and, and the best is good enough for all of us, right? A lot right. we give ourselves such a hard time for not doing what we want to do the right way, or hitting our goals, or making yeah. this much money, or all this. But the reality is, as long as we're on this life and on this journey, and we we legitimately do the best we can do, and we learn and grow, that's enough. Yeah. Right. So on my deathbed, you know, if I give people advice, is 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 slow down. Right. Interesting. Yeah. You know, slow down. My wife, my daughter taught me this years ago. My, my Ava, one day we were walking and she goes, daddy, she goes, come here. And she literally, I'll get tears right now. She goes to me, I want you to do me a favor. This is my five-year-old dude. Yeah. Uh, and says, I want you to smell this rose. And my, my daughter loves roses. My daughter loves flowers. We have roses outside our house. Yeah. And I smell it. And she goes, you know what I want you to do, daddy? I want you to take time and smell the roses. That's what she tells me at five. <laughs> Right. That's and I tell my right. wife this when I got home and my wife and I are crying and she goes, our yeah. children are our best teachers. Wow. So we got to slow down. We got to enjoy life, good or bad. It is what it is. Yeah. Um, people have it way worse than we do. And uh, obviously people have it way better than we do, but we don't know what people are going through in life. We don't know yeah. the billionaires and the millionaires out there, what they're really going through in life. You just see mm. the outside, uh, but you don't see the inside. And so I would tell people, you know, slow down, enjoy the moments uh, and try to make a difference. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one difference can go a long way. You know what I'm saying? It could. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I would say. That's I awesome. Thank you for that, that answer. answer. That Thank was you. Beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Every You're time welcome. we've asked this question, we always get some really deep, amazing answer. And I love it. I absolutely love it. Thank you for that insight. Yeah. You're um, welcome. You're welcome. Final question for you. 
what is next? What is on the horizon for you? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm all in with BSM, man. BSM is my everything. Um, you know, this company, I started out with just an idea. Um, it's nowhere near where I want it to be. So for me, next is uh, evolving and growing, uh, becoming a great leader in, in my industry, growing my company from within, um, taking BSM Vault to, to an eight-figure agency. There, there is no next step, actually, Gabriel. The, the funny thing is, it's not, it's not like there's not an end. It's, it's just we just continue going, man. We wow. just continue going. The chapters of our <laughs> book, they're never going to end. You know, even when we go away, wherever we go, we're going to go somewhere, whether it's a spiritual, whether it's the stars, whether it's this, whether it's that, we're going to go somewhere. We'll figure it out. Come so, on. Come on. Wow. wow just dude. flow, man. Just flow. <laughs> oh, that's so good. And well, I just want to let all of our listeners know uh, that, you know, we're going to make sure that we have Alex's, uh, if you guys want to hook up with him, we have all of his links in the description below. I really look forward to maybe doing this again sometime, maybe in person after this pandemic or something. You got it, man. I appreciate you guys. Thanks for keeping it real. Keep doing what you guys are doing. I appreciate you guys, man. Best of success and health and everything for you guys. 